Right, so I'm back here with Mike Martin from Peterson Fluid Systems. And so now we're just going to talk kind of about some things to, to, watch, to watch out for, some, some pitfalls that would indicate that you need to modify your rolling system, a little bit of oil theory, um, you know, and, and just kind of general approaches to oiling systems. So, mm -hmm. so let's kind of start with, you know, you, you're, you're modifying your car, you, you have your race car, you're starting to put it out there, you know, run it on the tracks, you're going to, or the series that you're going to run into, and you start to notice some issues. What are some of the things, some of the problems you would start to notice as you're driving the car or doing data collection that would indicate you need to take a good look at your oiling system and start to modify it? I think the first thing you would ever notice is have a good oil pressure gauge. Uh, sure. Oil pressure is going to tell you a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. Now, seeing a drop in oil pressure can be one of several things, and you kind of have to work that out. But um, you know, it kind of depends on when when is that oil pressure fall off happening. Is it happening at the end of a long straight? Is it happening in the middle of a corner? Is it happening right. on launch? Is it happening on deceleration? Like all of these things can tell us. Um, you know, that possibly we've got to look at the oiling system and figure out what's happening so that we make sure that the oil or that the engine stays alive. Sure. So the oil pressure gauge is probably like one of the top three gauges that you'd want on a race car. Yeah, you definitely want to know absolutely. what your oil pressure is. And a light and a warning light if, if at sure. all possible. Sure. Help, yeah. help try and save the engine. Yeah. So, so as your pressure starts to drop, you know, definitely paying attention to where it's dropping. What, mm -hmm. what are the conditions where it's dropping? So mm -hmm. you can start to evaluate what it is. Is it something as simple as like we've touched on in some of the previous videos, position of the pickup in the pan, mm -hmm. something like that for say, or is it something where it's going to be a lot more pronounced? Right, right. So one of the things we can look at, if it's happening on the top end of a long straight or something like that where you're running really high revs, yeah. we could be talking about cavitation. Sure. Uh, what, what happens with cavitation is you just don't have enough flow for the motor's needs. Like it's, it's needing more oil, it can't get it fast enough, now that can happen for a number of reasons. If if you're really running, running really got uh, really high revolution again right. of the motor and the pump spinning, you can actually get to a point where the pump is spinning so fast it can't fill fast enough, and then you end up with air pockets, and then that leads to cavitation. Right. So that's that's something that uh, you know, especially as you start to modify an engine, you might go over scenes like there. There's actually an efficiency range, like on your pumps, on pretty mm -hmm. much any oil pump. There's an RPM range where it's going to be most efficient, mm -hmm. and almost like a turbocharger, if you go too far out of its efficiency range by going too fast, all of a sudden you're not actually flowing as much oil, and then it, your pressure can, and volume can both drop off significantly mm -hmm. if you push too far outside of that window. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen you know where people try to upsize an oil pump, sure, like because it's available. Well, right. you're just going to exasperate that problem because right. if you can't fill on this size oil pump, it's certainly not going to be able to fill. Uh, that pumping section on a larger oil pump. Sure, sure. So that's that's based on our engine RPM. Mm -hmm. So that's again is one of those indicators. Like if it's if basically you're running a pump so fast that it can't work efficiently. Right. That's one of the indicators where you need to now move the pump outside of the engine and get it out of that one to one drive. Yeah. So now you can you can dial in. You know you know the RPM range that you're going to be using the engine in. Make sure that the pump is going to be in its optimal RPM range in that same mm -hmm. engine speed. You can also see that same problem as if you're in an external pump and you have a big enough supply line on the pump. That okay. same, you can run into that same issue where it's not like the needs of the motor are outpacing what the pump is providing. Gotcha. So what what are what are some of the guides for like size of tank? You know, you said this is a drag racing tank. It's got mm -hmm. about a gallon and a half capacity. You can go all the way up to six gallons. What are what are some of the indicators for the size of the tank that you would need, and what are maybe some of the benefits in going with a larger tank versus a smaller tank? The, the, the real thing is how long are you going to be running the car. Okay. Um, that's really how we size an, an overall oiling system, which the tank is a big part of that capacity. So uh, if you're running drag racing and you're running a 9 second quarter mile and 10 second quarter mile, you know, you might fill the tank, uh, empty it and fill it a couple of times on a pass. Right. Um, so you can go with a small tank. This is our drag racing tank. We run this tank on everything from Subaru drag cars up to Pro Stocks. Sure. This is just fine. Um, if you start getting into something that's more, say, a two or three lap time attack car, right. we might up it a little bit, yeah. just because again we want that tall column of oil over the pickup to right. prevent, you know, the the oil trying to move up and down the the uh, the walls. Sure. Um, when you go up to like a six gallon, a five or six gallon capacity, that's when we're talking big high. Uh, uh, high lap, large oval kind of racing, which would be NASCAR. Right. Um, right. I mean, multiple, 
like hundreds of laps, multiple hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where you're dealing with a lot of heat issues. You're sure. dealing with loss of oil issues over the course right. of the race, um, things like that. So um, now the benefits, you want to strike a balance of weight. You sure. want to strike a balance of where can I fit this thing? Like we've created some crazy looking tanks just so they could fit in the car because... Where they wanted to be just for yeah. balance. Yeah. Right. Well, and you end up with some of these drag cars and stuff, especially the dragsters, rear engine dragsters have yeah. very, they have odd spaces to fit sure. oil tanks. Sure. But if it's if it's a more production based car, you got mm -hmm. a lot more room to work. Yeah. Um, if you're mounting the, the tank further back in the car, like if you're going to try and mount it almost to a rear quarter, mm -hmm. would you want a larger tank because now the, the time from the oil going from the tank into the engine would be longer? We or usually what? don't upsize the tank, but you do want to upsize the feed lines. Okay. So you can actually, even even out of the feed lines, there's some customization that could be done as far as like oh. how, how much volume you can move and at what speed. Yeah, absolutely. Usually if it's more than six feet from the pump, um, okay. we tend to go up to a 16 feed line. Okay. Um, if it's right next to the pump in the engine bay, usually you can get away with a 12, so okay. a dash 12A end line. So. Okay. Let's, let's talk about engine needs. So like one of the things that you that we've talked about in the past is, you know, as engine builders start to modify tolerances, mm -hmm. that, that can be another thing. So we talked about engine RPM, mm -hmm. you know, and, and pushing a pump out of its RPM efficiency range. But if you start to change tolerances in an engine, that can also be something where now you can't change the stock pump enough to make it work based on now what the engine requires being having tolerances modified. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the instances of that that you run into? Well, we've run into, uh, you know, on a drag car, if somebody wants to run more boost, one of the ways to do that and keep the motor healthy is you up uh, the the uh, clearances on the mains, the bearing clearances. So you run a looser bearing clearance. You run a looser bearing clearance, for you, then you get a higher cushion of oil. Right. But when you do that, you're going to see your pressure drop if you don't do anything with the oil pump. So, so this, is, this is something, uh, volume versus pressure. They're, right. they're not the same thing. They're, right. they're certainly related. It's kind of like torque and horsepower, mm -hmm. but you've got to pay attention to them both individually. So, like, so what you've seen is as you increase the, a, a loser tolerance, you're reducing the restriction in the engine. So now that's where you need a higher volume to maintain a same, uh, the same pressure. Yeah, if you still want 70 psi at 6,000 rpm, right. you're going to have to increase uh, the volume putting in so that you can maintain that pressure. Gotcha. And, and as far as like target pressure, that there's this old adage that it, it might be data now, but basically it was uh, about 10 psi of oil pressure for every thousand RPMs. So it's just kind of a rough, very rough guide as far as what you want your target pressures to be. Would you say that that's still current or? It's a good starting place. Um, but we've found we've had some customers that have found that um, once you get over a certain pressure, you start putting more parasitic drag. So sure. you have to balance that like. Do I need? Do I really need 70? Do I really need 80 psi of oil pressure? Can I get away with 60 and gain three horsepower, four horsepower? Right. So there's a balance there that you want to strike. So if you're spinning 10,000 rpm, you probably don't need 100 psi of oil pressure. Like right. you know, depending. And again, this all comes down to your motor. Like every sure. motor is different. Every motor setup. Every and even sometimes when you set two motors up exactly the same same parts for whatever reason, this one wants a little bit more oil than the other one. Right. Like it's. So there's there's you have to know you work with your engine builder mm -hmm. know exactly what the engine is doing. Yeah. And, and and this is something like if you're going to go to this level, this is not something where you can necessarily say like. Uh, there's there's not a canned answer. You've got to do some testing like, mm -hmm. for for your specific engine and your specific condition. But mm -hmm. what you kind of want to find is that there's a there will be a happy medium where you have sufficient oil pressure to create the bearing in the engine, but then you you're not make, creating too much beyond that, so you don't have any issues with uh, or, or mi you're minimizing parasitic drag. Yeah. So you can actually make power by working the pump less hard almost. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that and. Again, this is something like there's there's testing involved. You got to work with the engine builders, but being able to have a customized oil and system like this, you can actually find out what that what that ideal pressure is mm -hmm. and dial it in. Yeah, yeah, you can dial it in and get yourself set up. You know where the motor's happy, and, sure. and that's um, yeah, that's the benefit of going to this external system. Sure. sure. The other thing is, uh, let, let's talk some more about the scavenging sections. So mm -hmm. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense where if you're going to have a remote location for the oil, you can't be reliant on gravity to drain the oil back to the pan. You're going to have to pump it back to the pan. So that makes perfect sense. But there can, 
there can actually be some big advantages to having those scavenger pumps. So, so let's sure. let's talk about more about what that might be. Yeah. So, um, like we were talking about in the dry sump section, is that uh, that environment inside a crankcase um, is hurricane force winds. Sure. There, there is so much air and oil being sloshed around in there from the right. movement of the crank, the pistons coming up and down, the air leaking past the rings. Um, there's just a lot going on, yeah. and it tends to froth the oil into right. this sort of milkshake um, situation. So by having scavenge, when you go to a dry sump system, right. you're going to be removing that oil from multiple places in the pan, so you're gonna, it's going to help you in situations, road racing, drag racing, stuff where the oil wants to move around a lot. Right. It's also going to help remove a lot of that air away from the... Um, okay out of the crankcase. Because if you figure, you know, just on a static motor, 2% leak is right. fairly normal. Right. When, a, when you actually get a piston rocking in a cylinder, that actually goes up a bit, and that's sure. on an NA motor. Right. When you add force induction into this mix, yeah. whether it be turbo, supercharger, nitrous oxide, you're going to end up with even more air in the crankcase. Okay. So if you take the CFM of your turbo, and then figure six okay. percent of that air is actually going into your crankcase. You're going to figure out that's a lot of air. Yeah. Like that's. Um, so and, and just on, just real quick on a, like on a race car, you have you know, the ability to like uh, do vent atmosphere. You can just like some of the old V8 guys you seen with actually filters on the valve covers. When you have a production car, kind of what we're talking about with this crankcase pressure stuff is what is dealt with with the PCV system, mm -hmm. positive crankcase ventilation system. And that's, that's why these modern cars have these systems, because even the OE manufacturers know there, there's going to be this pressure in the valve covers and in the crankcase that you have to address. You've got to give it some place to go. Mm -hmm. But then, with, so, so with the scavenge, you can actually, it's like you're actively moving the oil, you're actually also actively removing this air from, from mm -hmm. the crankcase. Yeah, and in some motors, they'll even go to a vacuum situation. Okay. Um, you know, like, for instance, this is a vacuum pump uh, made by Star. This isn't made by us. Um, but in, in race situations, they'll actually go to a point of pulling a vacuum in the crankcase. Wow. Because the, the benefit of that is um, if you get all of that air out, then that's less restriction. When the piston moves down in the cylinder, it's not trying to compress that air. Right. It's not trying to push that air out of its way. Right. And you're also getting... Um, you're being able to evacuate all that oil, all that air, and get that junk out of there. Right. Um, so, so basically, you're 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 optimizing the environment, basically on the bottom side of the piston mm -hmm. that, that the engine is rotating. Worth mentioning that that is, that is something that is for more of a, a drag application or, or a short duration use. Right. So, something that's that extreme. To so, that extreme, yes, yeah. But in other situations, in other kind of racing, anything, you're going to benefit any time you can move air out of the sure. crankcase. Um, that is extreme, and there's other situation, other things you have to do to the motor to make that work really well. Sure. Um, sure. Seal, sealing the valve covers, sealing. But it does highlight, you know, this is why the benefit is. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the extreme case, and those guys, you know, when, when they're trying to make every last horsepower, because mm -hmm. that's the difference between first and fifth place. That ex going to that extent, you can that's it can make that kind of a difference. Yeah. But for a road race car, that's, a, you know, a little bit extreme, but having these scavenge sections to actually like move this pressure out of that out of that you still get some of the gains that's mm -hmm. not as extreme yeah that's what in a basic a basic dry sum system is usually one pressure to scavenge okay but if you want to move more air more right. oil out of that crankcase or if you want to start scavenging lifter valleys heads things like that yeah. to also get that air out sure um, you can go to a five six I mean like I said we've done a nine stage pump right, but right. I mean the more you the more you can get that stuff out the better, uh, the better your engine's going to work. The more efficient it's going to be, the better oil it's going to be, because you can end up with things um, where you get oil trapped in the heads, oil right. trapped up in the lifter valley, because there's so much crankcase pressure that that stuff doesn't want to drain back. Right. So it's like a, a Subaru engine or a Boxer engine is kind of a perfect example of where you can run into that circumstance. You have your heads that are on either side of the engine, and then basically you're just reliant on gravity to move that oil down into the pan, into the center. Mm -hmm. But if you if you the, the pistons are pressurizing that center section, like with the with the leak down and everything. Mm -hmm. So if you if you have this high pressure there, that could actually prevent the oil from moving back because it, the pressure is actually pushing the oil back into the head. Yeah. Okay. So 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 the last thing that we should talk about is is the oil itself. So we we talked about the oil pumps. You know, there's a range that it op, 
the oil pump will operate most efficiently. But it's worth mentioning that the oil itself, there, there is a temperature and a consistency where it actually operates most efficiently. Mm -hmm. and, and something like a dry sump system or, or you know, when you're modifying a, the oiling system, considering that is also you know, a way to maximize the, the, the function of the oil and the protection of the engine. Yeah, it's important to keep the oil within a certain temperature and also try to get as much air out of the oil after it's been frothed up by the crank. Right. Um, it's much better to get that air out of the oil as much as possible and that's right. what a, an oil tank will do. It's also, they make, um, we don't happen to make one, but they do make air oil separators sure. um, which work very, very well at getting the air out of the oil. The tanks do a fair job um, right. and we've run them in, in thousands of different applications and they do yeah. a great job. Uh, we've built a lot of technology into the tank to get that air as much out of the oil right. and get it out of the tank in a, in a way. Um, uh, and the reason for that is, you know, the, the oil, will, when it when it froths, the, the reason that the oil will froth up or can froth up is because the oil will actually hold the air, mm -hmm. like it'll suspend the air in the oil. So mm -hmm. if you're sending an air and oil mixture into the engine, you're not going to get as good of protection and lubrication as you would if it was just all oil. Yeah, it's not going to lubricate uh, right. your bearings and, and your surfaces right. as well. And, and oil manufacturers too, they'll put additives in there to try and reduce frothing, mm -hmm. but it's still you know, going to happen. Yeah. But and then also just about the temperature. So something you know where you've got a big tank, uh, you know, the you know heat can radiate from this tank, mm -hmm. and you've got a much higher volume. Like is there, there's a weight penalty for adding oil volume, but as you're adding volume, just just the the extra amount of oil can absorb more heat mm -hmm. and then dissipate it, so it'll be at a more even temperature. Yeah, uh, all of our tanks are made out of a spun, uh, spun aluminum, so they transfer heat very well while the oil is sitting in there. Yeah. So it helps cool it down. Yeah, and it keeps the oil at its operating temperature because also when it when it's at its perfect temperature, that's when you're going to get the best protection and, mm -hmm. and have the best viscosity. So, yeah. Bert, well, well, thanks for all the information. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, thanks for sitting down with us. Hopefully, you guys like this. If you, if you found this helpful, please drop a like and uh, stay tuned for more Flatirons Tuning Tech Talk.